Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm from Cleveland, Ohio, and this is Dr. Jipraj Mukherjee. I'm an economist. Uh, thank you for being here today. So we are going to talk about the digital Silk Road. Primarily, we're going to talk about the digitized economy and how China is playing a role here. And uh, frankly, China, China is the elephant in the room when we think about China, because the reason is the Western order, what happened for the last so many years post World War II, we always thought about the Western order. Now, what's happening right now is again, a, a kind of a bi bipolar global world. And we are going to talk about that here in a minute. So the first thing that we are going to mention over here is, um, of course, my name, let's see if this is working. Yeah. Hopefully. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so digital Silk Road, that's my first section. Um, the first thing is digital Silk Road was mentioned by Chinese President Xi Ping. This was back in, in July you know, 2015. This is part of the broad spectrum of the Belt and Road Initiative. Okay, so that was the first time when he talked about it, when he pitched the digital Silk Road. So what happened then is by, nine, by 2017, China declared formally a new initiative to create a digital Silk Road as part of the Belt and Road Initiative. And there were quite a few countries who immediately signed up the, uh, you know, the MO, the Memorandum of Agreement. Uh, with China, with, with in terms of the digital Silk Road. And among the Western powers, of course, the US was not one of them. Of course, the UK was not one of them. But if you think about the Eastern European bloc, the Eastern European bloc was quite satisfied and they immediately saw that that MO is a very important thing that they have to do. And why, why they are uh, kind of lining up with China, we will see that just in a bit. So that's exactly what the introduction is. Basically, by, by 2015, it was launched as part of the Belt and Road Initiative, and then it became Digital Silk Road. I'm not talking about the Digital Silk Road, essentially. I'm going to talk about China's uh, being the superpower status and how that is playing a role over here. So let's see. China in the 21st century. Why we are talking about China suddenly? The first thing, as you can see over here, uh, back in 2002, China's contribution to the global GDP was 8.1%. Hey, look at by 2022, it's 18.8%. .8%. From 8.1 to 18.8. .8, and by that time, US was 19.8 in 2002 and 15.8 in another like two decades. And Europe, it definitely lost quite a bit of global share from 19.9% to 14.8%. Of course, I'm talking about the purchasing power parity here when we are talking about this. And here we saw just during, uh, Dr. Data was mentioning about the about the COVID and all the disruptions that it caused, we saw that the global supply chain was in a complete disarray at that point in time, simply because of the fact that China being the supply chain house, if China was under the COVID constraints, that was having a huge impact globally. And we saw that all of us, that the supply chain management was uh, definitely not working, the prices are rising and so on and so forth. So that gives us the picture that the supply chain hub is China, and it's definitely gaining the power altogether. If I think about the number of countries that have joined China's Belt and Road Initiative by continent, I could see that African countries are there you know, predominantly. I could see Asian countries, not surprising because these are East Asian countries that are all there, but we could definitely see European countries and North American countries as well. Primarily, what I'd like to say here is, yes, I'm not going to talk about the uh, you know, the debt trap diplomacy and so on and so forth, because that is again under the umbrella uh, of the Belt and Road Initiative. But we are talking about the digital economy and how that's shaping up right now. So we can see that the Belt and Road Initiative as, as part of the overarching umbrella is definitely playing a role in terms of the countries being, you know, participants of that initiative. So while we are talking about the digital Silk Road, I'll give you a portrait. I'll give you four things out there. Communication network, we will talk about blockchain technology, we'll talk about artificial intelligence and patents. These are the four areas through which this is happening. So let's see what are these one by one. Communication network. So guys, when we talk about this, let's, let's understand the concept once again. 
first industrial revolution that happened from 1784, steam engine and so on and so forth. The second industrial revolution, if you think about it, that happened in 1870s. And that, that's because of the electricity, the invention of electricity. And because of that, you have the mass supply. It's because of the assembly line that kicked in and so on. The third industrial revolution happened in 1950s and 60s, post World War II, when we talked about electronics. This is the time when we are having the fourth industrial revolution, which is more of a digital economy revolution. And here, these are the four factors I've mentioned there, communication networks, artificial intelligence, blockchain technology, and these three pillars will give us the fourth industrial revolution. So communication network, it's definitely setting international standards in terms of, in terms of uh, you know, telecommunication. I could see all of here right now, we are having our smartphones, it's working, it's have a 5G connection and so on and so forth. That's what the, the baseline of, of this telecommunication standard is. Chinese built telecom technology can lead to a potentially damaging reliance on technology that can be subverted by foreign interests, which we know because there can be a nexus between Chinese state and Chinese private enterprise. That's not quite unambiguous in terms of their disassociation. Their disassociation are not quite exclusive. Uh, one can see that Chinese state has some influence on the Chinese private enterprise. In the long run, if long run, if this trend is not curbed or managed, China may garner an overwhelming influence on the setting of international telecommunication standards. How much influence China has right now in the, in the communication networks? Let's see. If you look at these are uh, these are the top brands in terms of telecom infrastructure companies. The top brands, and look at the first one out here, Huawei. Huawei is this Chinese multinational big giant. And look at their contribution, the brand value in 2022. It's $71.2 billion. Look at the second one, it's Cisco, which is 26.6. So China, in terms of Huawei being the Chinese conglomerate, it's two times, three times almost to the second runner, which is Cisco out here. And if you pay close attention, you will see that there are some other Chinese companies here as well when I talk about the top brand values in the telecom infrastructure. So that's where it's, it's definitely playing a role. In a similar way, if I look into the percentage share of 6G patents applications, uh, right now, as I, I was mentioning, 5G is working. Look about, uh, so look here about the percentage share of 6G patent applications. China is again at 40% of 6G patent applications. And then you have United States. And as you can see, if you look into the other advanced countries, Japan and Western Europe, I don't see much is happening out there. So that's how the dominance is uh, in, in terms of China, in terms of its influence in, in again, in the, you know, the telecommunication. Uh, size of the 6G market by region, if I look into by 2028 in millions of dollars, of course, this is predominantly still will be covered by the US, which is $364 million, apparently the 6G market will be. But the second is already China which is $251 million by, uh, the end of, uh, uh, by the end of 2028. So the, the, the bipolar setting that I've talked about, that bipolar setting is already playing a kind of a pivotal role out here. Now, if I look into the global mobile, uh, the global mobile base station, again, think about data in a way today. Data is the guru. Data is controlling everything. What we are doing right now, every little thing is data. And who is controlling data? That data governance is, is going to be huge. Now, if I look into the mobile base station all over the world, I find that by 2022, you will see that Huawei and ZTE, both are Chinese companies, that's more than 30% of the global market share already. And if I look about the other, which is 11%, there are many other Chinese telecom giants as well there, which I've not listed. But the ones that are listed is Huawei, which is 30% of the global mobile base station is given by Huawei. Just a few days ago, it had something with MTA in South Africa. It's expanding to these emerging economies uh, exponentially. So that's, that's something that you have to take care of and you have to think through that it's happening. So in the communication standard or in the telecommunication market, there is no surprise that Huawei and other Chinese companies they're playing a huge role altogether. Transnational data governance, and that's what I was referring to. 
that whoever controls data control right now the facts and the figures globally. So if I look into transnational data governance, these are all the countries where it's listed. These are all the countries where China has some kind of a facility, some kind of a facility to control the data uh, you know, transmission. So if I look at that map, this is almost the entire globe other than I'm leaving out North America uh, because we all know US and Canada are, are not privy to that. So if I take US and Canada out of it, you can see that's the entire global South. I hesitate to say the term South because apparently it says that all these emerging countries are South, but the entire global South, if I use uh, this, this particular terminology, are definitely controlled by Chinese enterprises in terms of their data governance, as we can see. So, so communication, China is well surpassed other than the US. Europe is nowhere in the picture whatsoever. Uh, 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 US is not the second fiddle anymore. In fact, it's US, China, and then the other countries at some point in time. And they are distant, quite, uh, uh, you know, quite distant from these two. Blockchain technology. Now, blockchain technology, I'm an economist, I told you. I'm not a blockchain technology you know, specialist. But I can tell you one thing. Blockchain technology is coming big time in terms of digital currency, in terms of cross-financial, cross-border financial settlements, and so on and so forth. So uh, this is just, again, a very brief idea. Blockchain applications can be set up to enforce smart contracts and agreements and promote cooperation and coordination throughout the value chain. And that is well established in, in the literature that blockchain technology is coming a big time. It allows transparently manage and provide governance for the goods, services, and intellectual property along the digital silk road. So that's blockchain technology, and that's coming big time. That's for sure. So what's happening if that's the case? Global blockchain technology market in 2021 is $5.85 billion. But hey, look at 2030, just eight years, seven years down the line, it's $1.23 trillion the blockchain technology market is going to be. From $5 billion to $1.23 trillion is how the expansion, how the expansion will happen. So given that, and we can see that blockchain technology has a huge use, as I was mentioning to you, cross-border you know, payments and settlements and stuff like that are already happening in blockchain technology. In fact, there are many central banks which are saying that they will digitize the economy, they will digitize the currency, in fact, digital currency is something, a very kind of a political hotbed as well. Do you need to have digital currency where it's cashless transfer altogether? Because that apparently for us, uh, being in America, it's, it's uh, somewhere uh, uh, hampering our personal freedom of what we can do, what we cannot, because everything can be monitored. Right. Um, so that's coming big time, blockchain technology. If that's the case, let's figure out how we all are doing other than China. Well, uh, we are not quite right there. Think about the global share of blockchain patents in 2021. Look at this pie chart, my friends. What do we see? Do we see any other countries other than this blue thing? No. We don't. 84% of blockchain patents are coming from China. Think about Cayman Islands. Cayman Islands is again an offshore country where Chinese multinationals are going and they're investing from there. It's an offshore account for them altogether. So 84% of blockchain patents are coming out of China, uh, United States, another 8%. And then we are, uh, the other countries are almost non-existent out there. Mm. So that's how the dominance is. And that's where they're controlling, already started controlling the digital market, the digital global market. Uh, the global blockchain patent applications filed by major companies in 2020. Well, there are, I have listed 20 companies out here. And if you pay attention to these 20 companies, 17 of them are Chinese companies. Mm. This is global I'm talking about. Out of 20 top, top 20 companies in terms of their blockchain patent, 17 of them, look at the percentage, it's 85%. 17 of them are coming out of China. So that's how the dominance is in terms of Chinese influence in the digital market. AI investments. We are academicians and we are already talking about chat GPT, right? Yeah. Chat GPT is something we are quite, we are almost like mind boggling how to really tackle chat GPT because students are giving answers using, you know, chat GPT. Yeah. That's AI. Yeah. And AI is coming big time. Yeah. And when we are talking about AI, this AI is going to influence our lives. 
So AI investment is happening big time and that's part and pillar of the industrial revolution that I'm talking about. How far in, is the AI investment going? Well, there are two countries who are doing AI investment. So there is no surprise that ChatGPT is something that we are right now talking here in the US and ChatGPT and stuff like that are coming out of China. Private investment in AI, and this is like 2020 data, I still haven't been able to crack 21, 22 data whatsoever. Uh, what I find is United States definitely, definitely topping the chart, and that is very pleasing to see. But then China is well above the European Union and the rest of the world. So even the AI investment, they are definitely going there. And I, I can see right now the AI investment is going to pick up in China as well, more than what they are doing in 2020 or what they did in 2020. Um, so all these factors out here, guys, I've talked about AI, I've talked about blockchain technology, I've talked about the patents that they're doing, I've talked about Huawei, they're big telecommunication giant. What they're trying to control over here is they're trying to govern the data. And why are they trying to do so? Because if you think about the Belt and Road Initiative, that's a physical infrastructure that requires you to provide loan to other countries and they will invest. There is a risk of default and so on and so forth. Instead, if you can control the digital economy, you don't have to do any of this physical infrastructure whatsoever. You need to control the digital economy through your conglomerates, which are like Huawei, which are ZTE, all these big, or Tencent, these big Chinese companies. And there you don't have to have a physical presence in that country. You don't have to deal with that country's domestic uh, you know, turmoil and so on and so forth. You can just control it using your soft power. You don't have to use your hard power whatsoever by doing so. So what are the concerns that we have? The concerns are quite tremendous. If you think about from the standpoint of, uh, 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 again, the free economies, from the free market economies that we really liked for the last 100 years altogether. Cybersecurity risk, data sovereignty of the economies, that there is no guarantee whatsoever. If you look at any of these Chinese conglomerates, you will see that some part of their ownership is under some kind of an, uh, you know, ambiguity. It's a veil of ambiguity that you really don't know who is controlling it. And that gives the suspicion that it's controlled by the Chinese state, Chinese government. So that's where the data sovereignty will play, uh, 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 will be under, uh, you know, definitely under added. China's party retains varying degrees of control over Chinese enterprises that supply digital infrastructure. And here I talked about something push and pull effect. So Chinese companies are going to all these emerging economies. That's the push. And the pull effect is now they're controlling the data of all, this, uh, all these countries. So they are pulling these, uh, these emerging economies back to China uh, in terms of lining up with China. And they are pushing these companies to all these emerging economies. With this push and pull effect, it's also called the Beijing effect. Uh, the Beijing effect is the term that Chinese definitely didn't like, but Beijing effect is the term that is often used in, in academia, non-academia as well. It's called something like this because it's really like the Chinese enterprises are going there and it's pulling uh, these, uh, these economies to China. So that's happening already. This is a paper, this is a very important paper that was published in July of 2022. Um, one from University of Oxford, one of the authors and the other one from the NYU. And we are here already in New York. So I thought this paper is something that we are going to talk about here. So that's happening big time. Recommendations, there is not much, but all I can say is you have to identify, you have to do a core petition, not a competition, neither a cooperation. You have to do a core petition. That means you need to compete with them. Also, you need to understand that China is coming big time. You cannot just refuse and keep your eyes shut and say, okay, this is not happening. This is happening and this is happening big time. How can you, you know, uh, compete and cooperate with China? That is going to be the key in the next two, three decades. So um, that's where, where I'd like to say that a cautious approach is required and that requires equal partnership. The emerging economies are not having equal partnership right now. China is controlling it. And that's something that we have to focus and ensure that equal partnership is maintained. Uh, with that note, I'll, I'll definitely end. And if you have questions, I'll answer. Yes, please. Thank you, first and foremost, for that. I was just floored. 
I just just could not imagine the data that you shared in there in terms of the the co complete almost takeover or control that uh, uh, that that China has. So I have two questions. One would one is more of here in the U.S. as you know the government up here is talking to block TikTok, right? So mm -hmm. a bit different, you know. It's it, you know um, if they don't want government working with the TikTok, so. Your, your thoughts on that, is this a correlation in terms of um, knowing this data, knowing this information and anywhere to start to prevent them having good control? Because if you're TikTok, then the Chinese government have control of everybody who use TikTok, is that correct? Oh, absolutely, that there is no doubt whatsoever. Okay. But it's, it's almost, I'd like also to add that not to just fry that small fish. Okay. Just to understand that the Chinese state is behind it. And if you just control one app, you can do so, but they will come up with another. Right. And it's it's almost impossible then to control that. Instead, my suggestion would be to compete. Do something to compete, not to leave that ground, not to leave it void right. so that they can enter. Right. Not to have that vacuum so that they can. But yes, absolutely. That's a kind of an offshoot of what we are talking about is why you know TikTok has been has been banned in the US and there are some other countries as we should call you right. Yeah. All right. The second one is with the chat GPT, if I may. Uh, right. What do we do plus in academia? I a student of mine did his uh, lease agreement and just went through and to chat GPT and had his lease agreement done. Right. That, that is a pertinent question. And I fear that I uh, I don't have the wisdom there to answer that question. However, I have to add that uh, I just saw an NBER paper, the National Bureau of Economic Research, and they have given a number of you know, points where we can actually, as academicians, as instructors, can yeah. use it for our classroom benefit, for, you know, uh, for all kinds of pedagogical purposes. And I was reading through it, quite a few things that we could do. How best we can implement those, we all Although in a real classroom setting, things can get a bit more challenging for judging. But yeah, it's it's coming big time. We cannot deny it once again. Chat GPT, Greg, I, I like that kind of an anecdote. Uh, back in 1990s, when Google came in, mm -hmm. we said, hey, is that a good thing that you can go to a search engine and find all the answers? Right? Right. Yeah, you're right. Uh, but now, okay, it's there. It's 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 really a complete ubiquitous thing altogether. So it's almost like that. At some point, it will come in. There was one picture I saw, which uh, there were some primary instructors, primary schools, like elementary schools instructors, they uh -huh. had some placards, like calculators are bad. Okay. <laughs> this is from 1970s. So that might answer that. No? Thank yeah. you. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, talk. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Much.